Welcome to the Resurrection Love Study Group. Today is October 5th, 2018. Amen. It's pretty cool here in Woodbridge, Virginia, but God is still blessing us. Thank you, Lord. Today we want to talk about an experience that all of us have had or will have and we don't too much like to think about it, but we have to think about it. You can't prepare for it. You don't pray for it, but it happens because of life, life and the way that it is. Life is like a vapor. So says the book of James. Uh, now you know that a vapor is here and then soon gone. And we have been discussing about the Holy Spirit and his work in our lives, how he convicts us and converts us, comforts and strengthens us, and teaches us more about the Lord, his character, his goodness, and his grace. Last week, we talked a little bit about Job and about the pain and suffering, but having the Lord walk with us. And I thought about that because it's so important for us to understand. And I think a lot of us as Christian people misunderstand that just because we are Christians, we believe that we'll always be prospering, that everything will be easy, and that we'll always be on top of the mountain and never have to walk through the valley. And that's just not so. So we want to continue to talk about walking with God through pain and suffering. And today we're going to look at a fellow that we all are familiar with, who teaches us and tells us so much as the Holy Spirit reveals to us through him the operation of what he does in our lives. And that is called the Job experience. Not job, but Job J-O-B, all caps. Job is the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament. He is called the persecuted one. That's what his name might mean, the repentant one, because he's going to go through some pain and suffering that you and I never imagined. Mm -hmm. We don't like pain and suffering. Matter of fact, we do all we can to avoid it. But I'm here today to tell you, first of all, the pain and suffering is never neutral. Hmm. It will come and come to us all, regardless of who you are, whether you're black or white, rich or poor, Republican or Democrat, or even independent. It happens to us whether you're young or whether you're old. You don't get a chance to pick how you're going to suffer, but you can be sure of this, that suffering will come one day or even many days or it might come more than once in your lifetime and the reason why is because suffering is a great teacher in the book of job we will see job who will be described to as a man who loved god and hated evil one day when god called all the sons of god together satan also comes and the Lord asked him a question, well, where have you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro, up and down in the earth. Meaning that the devil always is roaring about as a lion seeking whom he may devour. You must know as a Christian believer that you and I are always under constant attack. Job will tell us that in his life, God had put him up as a contestant. He will never find out why he suffered, but he will be a child of God who will walk with God through his pain and his suffering. So Satan shows up. God asks him where he been. Satan answers, and then God lifts up and says, Have you considered my servant Job? And then Satan says, Well, yeah, I considered him, but you've got a hedge around him mean that you won't let me get to him. Hmm. And God said, I'm going to take the heads down and you can do whatever you want to do to him, but only don't take his life, which lets you know that even the devil 
has to answer to Almighty God. So we all know the story. Satan goes back and he begins to destroy the life. His objectivity is to destroy the faith that Job has placed in God. And I'm here today to tell you that that is the devil's number one operation, is to destroy the faith that you have placed in the Almighty God and Jesus Christ. If he can destroy your faith, then he believes that he has won just another battle. There are many Christians who have had wrong theology and wrong misunderstanding about pain and suffering. Job will never find out why he had to go through what he had to go through. When you and I read it today, in which I've spent a considerable amount of time in reading it, it will show us that pain and suffering comes to him no matter whether you are rich or poor. Job is described as a rich man, and he's described as a person who has a lot of cattle, has servants, has camels, and that was to describe to us in the Old Testament. That's how they describe the rich man. Notice it gives us his livestock. It doesn't say a lot of things about gold and silver. That lets you know that Job was a person who was well beyond, uh, well, and some scholars even believe that this was written or this happened way before Genesis did, or right after Genesis. You'll find also that in, in Job chapter 42, that when this happened to him, he probably was a younger person because in Job chapter 42, verse 16, it's going to tell you that Job lived to be 140 years and he had some children. Now, the thing that we got to understand, and, I wanna, and I'm often surprised by Christians who are often downcast, who are often hurt that they are going through pain and suffering. And that's what I mean, that pain and suffering is never neutral. It comes to us all alike in different ways, different places in our lives, at different times in our lives. And so a lot of times we try to prevent pain and suffering, but we just can't prevent it. It's a part of life because after all, it is a good teacher. So you should never be surprised when pain and suffering begins to happen in your life. And I thought about that all throughout the week because in 2010, I had a stroke. I never anticipated the stroke happening. I didn't ask for it to happen, but it came. And I, I'm going to share some things with you because even after I was in the hospital, I laid there in the bed with unrealistic expectations because as I went through therapy, I told the lady that was there helping me, I said, oh, I'm going to be back up and running again in just a few more weeks. And she said, no, William, I don't think that that's going to happen. Which tells you that when we read the book of Job, we don't know how long he suffered. We don't know how long he was in pain. We just know that he had to go through pain and suffering. So as a believer, and as we've been taught all our lives, that it rains on the just as well as the unjust. Pain and suffering comes to you whether you are a believer in Jesus Christ or whether you have not received Christ as Savior and Lord. Hopefully, if you have received him as Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit is always available to comfort you and strengthen you in the midst of your pain and your suffering. I want to share some things with you that's right here in the book of Job that I know that will help anybody whether they had a stroke, whether they had a heart attack, whether they broke some bones, whether they have particular health issues, pain and suffering comes through finances, comes through emotions, comes through physical pain, and it can even be spiritual pain. Job, we will see, will go through some immense things in our lives that we often would say we wouldn't wish that on anybody. Because not only will he lose his wealth, not only will he lose his health, but he will lose the help of others. 
but he teaches us a valuable lesson to keep our hand in God's hand in the midst of our pain and suffering, and he will see us through. Now, I know that a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to go and pray, and it's just going to all whip mm -hmm. away, mm -hmm. all go away. We've been taught that Jesus died, that by his stripes we are healed. But that does not necessarily mean that as you go through physical pain and suffering, that you will be healed physically. You can be healed emotionally. You can be healed spiritually. You can be healed psychologically. Job will go through some immense, and he will receive telegram after telegram. And each one of the telegrams they receive will be worse news than the telegram that he received before. But he's going to say something to us that should all keep us in the right perspective after he gets all of these telegrams of nothing but sad and bad news. He's going to say something to us which should help all of us. Now, I'm going to say some things today that I know will help you because when we begin to suffer, most people don't know that we bring something with it. And a lot of times what we bring with our suffering shapes our mindset. When I suffered a stroke, I had unrealistic expectations. But suffering, if you think about it, makes you slow down, makes you begin to think about things that you had previously never thought about. It makes you think about life, makes you think about God, it makes you think about others. Yeah. It even makes you think about death. Mm -hmm. All of that pain and suffering will make you think about all of that. And a lot of times people try to play like God is stupid. Well, I'm going to pray to him. He's going to get me up out of my sick bed. And then uh, they make promises to God while they're laying down. God gets them up. And the promises that they made, they forget all about them. And they get to ripping and running all over again only to find out later on that it comes back to haunt them all over again. Well, Job is not going to do that. He's going to teach us some valuable lessons about God. He's going to learn some valuable lessons about himself. And he's also going to teach us some valuable lessons about others. Because right along with unrealistic expectations of life and about pain and suffering. You can have unrealistic expectation of others. God reveals his true character, his character in the book of Job, because he reveals to Job that he is the sovereign Lord, that nobody can counsel on him or tell him what to do. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter whether you're in the best physical shape, and sometimes I just laugh at people. They say, man, the doctor told me I'm in good shape. And I say, well, what the doctor didn't tell you is, is that can change overnight. Mm -hmm. Because sickness has a point in time, as well as healing has a point in time. We can always think that we can get better, and I thought about this earlier today. I thought that I was going to get better, and I thought that it would happen a lot quicker, which made me think unrealistically. But at the same time, it made me kind of slow down and say, okay, you got to think about some things. And I started thinking about that thing. And so it helped me to see God in a different way, in a way that I had never seen him before. And it also helped me to see others and how they are how we can expect them to come and help us. And I said to somebody earlier today, never think that another person will become your personal Messiah because that's not designed, it's not designed. Your pain and suffering is not to be fine, not for you to look for another uh, Messiah or another Savior because there's only one. Now, when we begin to suffer, and this is so true, we all have expectations, we have assumptions, we have perspectives, we have desires, we have attentions. Our decisions, 
over our suffering uh, can really shape uh, our decisions. Because when our decisions are shaped, and you see so many people who, and that's why a couple of weeks ago I showed you about the man that was laying at the pool of Bethesda for 38 long years. He started having a pity party because he told the Lord, when the water begins to move, I have no man that can put me in the pool. By the time I get to the pool, somebody already then jumped in. And all of that was meant for him to meet the master. It wasn't never the pool that made him well or would make him well. It was only the Lord who could make him well. I think about this all the day long because if you've ever noticed, all of our medical science, all of our so-called remedies, all of our prescription drugs and everything is shown to us over the television during the daytime. Most of the time at night, they'll show us some insurance commercials. But during the daytime, they're going to show us this prescription works for this, this prescription works for that, this works for this, that works for that. Only to find out later on that the side effects will cause you even more damage. All I'm really saying to you is that we have spent millions and billions of dollars looking and taking prescriptions that have never really made us well at all. We just thought that they did. Now, that does not mean that we should stop taking our medicine, but what it does mean is that we need to place our faith in the right person and let that faith be uh, grown in us as we grow in the Lord. Now, not only do we have all of these expectations and, and all of these decisions that we may make and have to make and intentions, and I never thought that when I had my stroke in 2010, that I would still be somewhat down in this 2018. But I thank God because you have to always think that God is right there with you in the midst of your illness. Last week I told you that if we would understand and get a better understanding of Genesis 3, we would understand why pain and suffering takes place in our world. A few weeks ago I showed you the three groanings that happens in Romans chapter 8, that the creation of God groans because of sin, that you and I, though we are sinners, we groan waiting for the redemption of our bodies, and that the Holy Spirit groans because he takes up the thing that we're not able to utter before the very throne of God. All I'm really saying is you and I as human beings should never be surprised by anyone's pain or suffering. Now, I know that a lot of people live superstitiously. They believe that if I live a pretty good, decent life, if I eat well, if I exercise well, then I'm just never going to have any pain or suffering. Wrong. That's just not true. There are a lot of people who have eaten, eaten pretty well, who exercise and run a couple of miles a day, who get proper rest. That's all the prescriptions that the doctor would give you who all of a sudden they fall ill. Now, when we read the book of Job, we don't know how his physical condition was before the sore boys came upon his life. We just know that they did come. And then when they did come, they came because Satan brought them. As you teach, um, people who may be suffering may be angry or even hateful toward their predicament and even angry toward God. So... You know, I'm going to talk about that because Job, he's going to say some things because when his friends show up, after he has lost his wealth, lost his children, lost his influence, lost his health, all those things happen to him. His friends show up. Even his sidekick, his wife, tells him to curse God and, and, and why don't you just go ahead and curse God and die? And he tells her, you're speaking as a foolish woman. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean that Job's wife is a bad woman because later on, he still will have some children. But what that does teach you that is things can go pretty bad. They can go from good to bad in a moment's notice. And we begin to have pretty pity parties. We become depressed. 
we become despondent, we become discouraged. One thing all of us have got to be sure of because of the sin effect, and I said to somebody earlier this week that all of us have in our DNA sin. Every one of us has sin in our DNA. And the reason why I can say that is is because somebody is dying every day. Mm -hmm. We don't like to deal with it. We don't like to talk about it. We think that somebody ought to live such and such time. We think that we should never get ill. We think that everything ought to be peachy cream, and it's just not going to be that way. Jesus was sinless, and yet he suffered. And his intense pain and agony was not because of anything he had done, but it was for us. Which does not mean that we're not where we will be excluded from pain and suffering. It just means that we can overcome our pain and suffering by the aid and operation of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we begin to read Job, but I'm going to show you something. A lot of people, and I want to talk to Christian people, they start having these pity parties, they start doubting, they start having all these unrealistic expectations. They think that God ought to just get them out of their sick bed and they just got sick that morning of and it just doesn't happen and when things don't happen the way that they should, they say, well, where is God at? And all the doubt start coming in as well as depression. When you look at Job and I want us to look at chapter 2 verse 10 Job says something to all of us that we must understand. Job chapter 2, verse 10. But he, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish this women. This is Job talking to his wife. You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? Now, now notice. Job said, we have accepted good from God, which all of us have, because we have lived from day to day. All of us have received good from God. The rain, the wind, the strength, the food, the clothes, all the daily necessities. That's God's good. He doesn't owe us anything. I know we live in an age of invincibility, and we think that we are independent and we just don't understand just how dependent we are on the almighty God. He tells his wife, we have received good from God, and we were happy about that good. But when these bad things start happening, we, re we got to receive those with the same smile and the same thankfulness that we receive the good. That's where a lot of people have problems with the pain and suffering. And even Christian people think that they don't have to go through any pain or suffering. And I say this all the time. If you did not have to have anything, any pain or suffering, you would eventually be like God's spoiled brats. Mm. And we would soon forget that it's God who's come, who's bringing all of this about, our, all this goodness. And we would think that it's because of something that we did. And I've seen it on TV shows early in the morning. I've seen older people who are 90 and 100 years old. And they say, well, what did you do to live so long? They say, well, every morning I drank I drank a glass of wine. It was never the wine that kept them alive. It was the Lord that kept them alive. Mm -hmm. But even with all of that, we still got to go through pain and suffering. We don't like pain. We enjoy pleasure. And that's why a lot of people misunderstand when you start talking to them about pain and suffering. They want to live without pain and suffering. Our TV, the commercials that we see, gear us toward us living a better life, to live a high life, to live a life without this pain and suffering that we want to live until we are through living and then die. And it just doesn't happen. We don't understand the effects of sin that has been in our existence ever since we came out of our mother's womb. David said, I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He understood that he was a sinner from the moment he came out of his mother's womb. 
Nobody has to teach a child how to do wrong. It's just already in them. And that's just the effects of what happened back in the Garden of Eden between Adam and Eve. They rebelled against God. They disobeyed God. And therefore, they brought sin into the world. But when we look at Job, we often think that we can, you know, just go without it. Now, I thought, I said, well, there's a commercial on TV now from the star of the guy who was the biggest loser. Uh, he had the biggest loser. He was the star of the biggest loser. He had a heart attack. He had showed countless people how to lose weight, mm -hmm. how to get in better shape, and then he has a heart attack. Right. And now he is advertising particular pills and stuff, which lets me know that he really ain't learned a lesson that he could learn. It is never the peels, it's always the Lord. So with this pain and this suffering, we got to understand that it teaches us a valuable lesson. And in that lesson that we learn, we, we bring something with our pain and suffering. And we don't understand that we when we bring it, it can hurt us. And I got to share this just by looking at Job and his friends that will come. Job has all of these bad experiences, messenger after messenger. He loses everything, and I say lose. He lost everything but his faith in the Lord. That was the one thing that the devil had told God. If I take all that from him, he'll curse you to your face. And so that lets you know right there that a lot of times when we lose stuff, we will blame God. But Job did not do that. And that was a good thing. God held him up. God blessed him and God strengthened him. And he got to see God in a way that he had previously never seen. Much like my stroke. When a Christian suffers, when we are, and we're very, we become uncomfortable when we are. And I remember I was laying in the bed. I had had a stroke. That nurse kept coming in trying to make me comfortable. I was so uncomfortable because my left side was just about gone. I was so uncomfortable, but the Lord told me, let me put you in a position to where you can be comfortable. Now that taught me, just like Job teaches us, that when we keep our trust in the Lord, we'll come out just fine. We like pleasure more than we like pain. And the pleasure that we like could very well be a sinful pleasure. Now we have bad theology when we see people in pain and suffering. When we go visit somebody that's having a hard time or going through difficult times, and you do know that difficulty is a great teacher, we start saying to ourselves, what is God punishing them for? Now, let me say right off the bat, a lot of times pain and suffering comes because of God chastising you because of a, of a particular sin, because we're not disciplined, uh, uh, pain and suffering come because he's trying to teach you another lesson about himself that you previously did not know. He's trying to teach you various things. Now, when we open up to the book of Job, the Lord said to Satan that he's a man who loves me mm -hmm. and hates evil. That doesn't mean that Job was perfect. Mm -hmm. It just meant that Job had a sincerity toward God that all of us should like. Now, even though we have a true sincerity to, towards God, which we should have, all of us should have, it does not mean that you will be exempt or excluded from going through painful or suffering times. It just doesn't work that way. Because God knows something about us that we haven't acknowledged ourselves. That the more pleasure we have, sooner or later we will forget all about him and we will claim that it's because of what we did. God knows it because we've been taught all our lives to be independent. And I think about this all the day long. Because even in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples then and you and I now, he told us to ask him for daily bread. He didn't ask us, to, he didn't tell us, well, ask me for weekly, a monthly, or yearly bread. He said, ask me for daily bread. Thank me for the daily bread. And what he was teaching us is 
You cannot live independent of me. You got to be dependent upon me for everything, for everything. Now, I want to read a couple of things here in the book of Job that will help us. And I think last week I showed you in chapter 19. Let's go back to Job chapter 19. When I had my stroke, the thing about pain and suffering, I told you that it's a great teacher. Difficulty is a great teacher. We try to immediately come out of it. But the thing about pain and suffering, that one thing we don't like, it exposes things about ourselves that we just did never acknowledge. When I had my stroke, it exposed the deep-seated fear that I thought that I never had. And I, tell, I used to tell folks, I've been around the world twice. I've been in places that you never could imagine. I've been on ships where the water was going up and the, and the ship was just going up and down, up and down, and I survived all of it. I've flown for 30 straight hours before never touching ground. I've been in places where the plane just dropped and all of that did not cause the fear that was exposed once I had the stroke. And now I don't like to really ride too much in the dark. Now I'm thinking that everybody that's driving me and I just don't jump in the car with anybody because I believe that everybody's driving too fast. It exposed the fear. This is what pain and suffering does. It exposes what is really been in your heart all along. And that's why a lot of times we don't, and because we don't, and I hear this all the time, with such and such, uh, they don't want to be in this predicament because they have to depend on so many people. <laughs> and that's what pain and suffering does. It teaches you that you've got to, first of all, depend upon God uh, and not make other people your, and I say this to younger kids all the time, and I've been saying this all week long. I always tell kids, when you get a certain age, you put out an insurance policy on your parents so your parents won't have to worry about paying an insurance bill. But even in that, we have unrealistic things that have been placed in our lives to make us think that no matter what comes up, if we save them enough money, if we eat right, if we exercise right, we'll be able to make it. And that's just not true. God has a file cabinet full of nothing but lessons to teach you and I. It has nothing to do with how good a shape you're in. It has nothing to do with how much money you save. It has nothing to do with whether you've eaten right. It has everything to do with whether or not you've placed your trust and your faith in the Almighty God. Because when it does come, it will expose what's been in your heart all along. I thought I could make it. I have been stationed with men who were walking and running around a track. And they fell down dead right there on the track. Had a heart attack right there on the track. And you look at them and they were skinny. And they looked like they were in good shape. But they just, you just never. All of our bodies begin its decay period the moment we are born. We just don't know when it's going to come into fruition. Now that's not to paint a, a gloomy picture. But you have to think about life realistically. That you and I are not invincible. That the only way that we're going to live through forever is that we give our lives to the Lord. And even in that, we're not going to live uh, forever in these bodies that is racked with sin and shame. So I want us to look at a couple of things. I want us to go back to Job chapter 19. Because Job will tell us something in Job chapter 19 that we have to pay attention to. Job chapter 19, verse 1. Start reading there. Then Job answered and said, How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces? Now, he's words? having a debate with one of his three friends. Keep reading. These ten times have the reproach me. The, they are not ashamed that they make yourself strange to me. 
and be it indeed that I have endured mine era remain with myself. If indeed the will magnify yourself against me and plead against me my reproach, know now that God has overthrown me and has compassed me with his net. Behold, I cry out of wrong, but I am not heard. Now, what is he really saying here? His friends are saying the reason why you're in the condition that you're in is because you must have done something wrong. Well, Job has not done anything wrong. God is using him as a contestant in a battle between God and the devil, Satan. And Job is the contestant. If Job fails, then the devil wins. If Job does not fail, then the Lord wins. And I said this last week. A lot of times, things are going wrong or the pain and suffering that we're going through. We don't understand that we're going through it for the glory of God. Mm. But we complain about being in it when all along the Lord is trying, and he might have put your name up. He might have put my name up. He can put anybody's name up because he's God. He's created us. He's brought us into existence. And therefore, what is happening to us and what we are going through in the pain and the suffering, we might be a very well a contestant like Job. Job will never know that it was God who put his name up before Satan. But now he said, okay, all these times I've been asking God, why am I going through this? Why God? Why God? Why? And when you are going through pain and suffering, the devil will always make you and make you think, well, God, where's God? Yeah, ask you a series of questions. Where is God? What have you done? What do you think about God? God has failed you. He makes these statements and these questions, and he makes you be, and he started working with you on doubt. Job is wanting to know, well, if I just knew, if I have, if I have committed an error or if I have sinned, then let me know why I've sinned and I will repent to the Lord, but Job has not sinned. And several times in the book of Job, it will say that Job did not sin, even with his own lips, he did not sin. Keep reading. In the middle of verse 7, I cry aloud, but there is no judgment. Now notice, he's crying aloud to the Lord in the midst of his pain and suffering. He has fenced up my way that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness in my path. He has Strip me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. He has destroyed me on every side and I am gone. Now stop. Now, now notice this. Job is talking to the Lord. He's talking to his friend, but he's talking about what the Lord has stripped me of my glory. Now he's lost his wealth. He lost his health. lost his influence. He's lost quite a bit. He lost his children. He lost all of it. But see, this is what gets me about people. We are so physical minded we're so we don't like to lose nothing but Job has lost all this but by the time we get to the end of the book he will have gained everything back plus some mm -hmm. because he said it right back there we receive good of the Lord mm -hmm. can we not receive bad in other words I've got to be happy when I receive good and I'm going to be happy when I receive bad because it's the Lord who gives and it's the Lord who takes it away blessed be the name of the Lord so the thing, we get upset when we, we get embarrassed because we have lost something. We get embarrassed because that lets you know that there's something. Now, what is it that is deep-seated in all of us? We have made ourselves an idol. Self, the self, this is why when Jesus said, if any man would be my disciple, the first thing he has to do is deny himself because the Lord knew that we have a tendency to be our own idols. We worship our, this is why people don't give properly in church. This is why people can't go and attend worship on a regular basis. This is why people always put themselves first. I got to take care of number one before I can help anybody else. I can't help you because I can't help myself because you have made yourself number one. Well, even with the president say, America first. And I told somebody, I don't want to live in a country where America is first, where the country is first. I want to live in a country where God is first hmm. because God don't accept second place. Hmm. 
I got to live in a country where God is first, not the Constitution, not the politicians, not the president, not the pastor, not the preacher. God is first. And that's what the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. So I said to them, I don't want to live in a country where America is America first. Because when we put America first, we're on our way down. We're dooming ourselves. So we have this idleness. Keep reading. Because Job is going to say, okay, I, if I have made an error, tell me what my error is. I want to know if I have made an error. Tell me what it is so maybe then things will turn around. Keep going. The middle of verse 10. And mine hope has he removed like a tree. He has also kindled his wrath against me. He thinks God angry at him. Mm -hmm. Now, see, this is what I mean that when a person is going through pain and suffering, you got to ask the Lord to guard your heart. Mm -hmm. Guard. And when I say heart, I'm not talking that what's in the middle of your chest. To guard your mind because the devil, that's where the battle is going on. If he can get into your mind, he'll start making you think some things that you ought never think about. I'm all alone. Just like the man at the pool. I have nobody here to put me in the pool. I've been here for 38 years. I thought about, you mean you've been in the pool for 38 years and nobody got you to the pool? He was having a pity party. Nobody was there. Now, the thing about it is we make ourselves idols. But the minute... We're going through a pain and suffering period. We start having all of these bad thought, thoughts, which leads us to doubt God. Don't nobody love me. Don't nobody care about me. Nobody's coming. You hear it all the time. Preach. I, I'm a preacher. People, how come you ain't went to see so-and-so? And I say, you just never know what God has taken them through to teach them a lesson. Because the pastor is not the Messiah. The church members are not the the, the saviors. God is the savior. Jesus is the savior. Mm -hmm. And we've got to understand that because the Bible tells us that if anybody be a sick, let him call the elders of the church and the elders of the church will come and anoint him with oil and pray over him. But a lot of times we just have expectations. That's what I mean. We have expectations. We assume that everybody knows that we're sick. And a lot of times we play that up. We play up our pain and our suffering. When we're supposed to continue to proclaim the Lord, everybody that's in this body, from Adam to the very last person, will have some period, some period of pain and suffering. Just read it. Anybody. Either they'll be put in jail, either they'll be whipped, either they'll be go through some. And when you look at the disciples that Jesus had, every one of them had a martyr's death, except John. He's out on the island of Patmos. If you read the church fathers, they'll tell you that before, uh, while he was out on the island of Patmos, they had already tried to boil well, him to death. Yeah. But the spirit of the Lord was so much in him that it didn't kill him. Hmm. But he was out there on the island of Patmos because God is the, holder, the, the ruler of both life and death. And so the thing about it, everybody. Now, even in this book called the Holy Bible, we often ask this question. I, I, I really got to think about it. I'm going to explain this in weeks to come. And we often say this. I, I think I'm doing all the right things. I'm going to church. I'm involved in the church, in worship. I love God. I'm praying. I'm paying. I'm doing the things that God But it seems like the person that's not going is living a happier life than me. Hmm. Because that's the devil playing with your mind. Why don't you just forget about all this church thing? And going back out there in the world. That's why, go to Proverbs uh, chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4, 23. I think that's the right one. Proverbs 4, 23. Keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now, when you go through pain and suffering, and I really want you to get this. It exposes your true attitudes. It exposes your true emotions. Anybody that has visit, ever visited a nursing home, or visited a home where the older people are, and you go through there and you hear them yelling and screaming and hollering at each other, 
get mad about it. It's just really exposing to you what had been in their heart all along. Because that's what God does. He exposes us once we realize what's been in our hearts all along. It's meant to make us come running to him because we need him to transform our attitude, our actions, our assumptions. We need to stop living in these false expectations. And man, they just it's just a litany of false expectations. Because I'm a Christian, I ain't never supposed to get sick. Because I'm a Christian, I ain't never supposed to be broke. They got people that come on the TV that say that every Sunday. Because you're a Christian, you must have done something wrong. That's what Job's friends going to say. Job, you must have done something wrong. That's why you're sitting here with all these boils over your body. That's why your children have been killed. That's why you've lost all your money. That's why you've lost all your influence. You must have done something wrong. And we do the same thing when we go visit somebody. Well, the Lord just paying them back for what they did. Well, how come he ain't paid you back? You done some wrong thing. That's just not, that's the devil talking through you to another person. Okay, keep reading. Uh, Proverbs? Yeah. Okay. No, well, Job. go back to Job. 19. Okay. Which verse? Uh, I'll, I'll start with verse 14. My relatives have failed and my close friends have forgotten. Remember I told you that when you're going through pain and suffering, notice he said my relatives are who? Failed. They, they have my, failed him. My close friends have forgotten me. My close friends have forgotten me. That's what pain and suffering exposes others. It exposes what others think. Keep going. Verse 15. Those who dwell in my house and my maidservants Count me as a stranger. I'm an alien in their sight. I call my servant, but he gives me no answer. I beg him with my mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife. And I'm repulsive to the children of my own body. Even young children despise me. I arise and they speak against me. All of my close friends abhor me. And those whom I love, I have, have turned against me. My bone clings to my skin and to my flesh. And I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. I have pity on me. Have pity on me, O you, my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. You notice what he said. Who is Job blaming? He said the hand of God has struck him. The hand of God has struck him. It wasn't really the hand of God. It was the Lord allowing it to happen. Mm -hmm. And he's going to thank God later on. Keep going. Verse 22. Why do you persecute me as God does? And are you not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Notice, now, he's going right back to where he needs to be. When you're going through pain and suffering, you go to the Redeemer. He said, my Redeemer lives. Keep reading. For I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Oh, man. And you hear preachers talk about that all. Now, this is what I want you to see about pain and suffering. It exposes what's really been in your heart all along. Number two, it causes you to doubt God. Suffering does not change you. It just exposes what's been there all along. Difficulty uh, 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 teaches us and reveals what's, what we're really made of. Uh, uh, number three, when we're going through pain and suffering, we have these unrealistic expectations of life. And a lot of times it's the church's fault because we don't explain it properly. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for good. Read that. Romans 8, 28. This is one of the most misunderstood verses in all the Bible. Just one of them. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are, are the call according to his purpose. Okay. 
Now, the key to understanding Romans 8, 28 is found in 29 and, 20 and 30. Verse 29 and 30, read that of the same chapter. For whom he did or no, he also did predestinate to be confirmed, conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate that he also called, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, what Romans 8.28 was really talking to you about is that no matter what you're going through, what God has begun in you, you can be sure he's going to finish it. That your true security lies not in your, in your achievements, but in your trust in the almighty God. That's what it really means. Now, when people go through pain and suffering, one thing that's expo exposed more than any anything is pride. We are so prideful. We are really prideful to the extent that a lot of time when we are going through pain and suffering, we don't want nobody to see it. We don't want nobody to know it. And therefore, we shut ourselves off. And God has to expose it. I've heard it over, over and over again. Well, I've been sick. Well, how come you didn't tell nobody? I just didn't want nobody to know. That's pride speaking. Pr Pride is our self-reliance and not our confidence on in, in God. Now, Paul will tell us something that we're going through pain and suffering. It exposes our weakness, our weaknesses. Read 2 Corinthians the fifth chapter in verse 15. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but who unto, unto him which died for them and rose again. Yeah, now when we understand just how weak we are, we will be able to understand what the Lord is really trying to do for us. Paul will boast not in his strength, but in his weaknesses. How many people you ever see boast in their weaknesses? Oh, I'm weak in this area. I'm weak in that area. I'm weak here. I'm weak there. No, we usually boast in our, in our strengths. And all along, the Lord wants us to boast that we're weak and that we're relying in Him and Him alone. Our problem is we don't like to appear weak. We like to always appear strong, and it hurts us. Go back to Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19. What verse? What verse in Job? Chapter 19. Where you end, end up off. Stop it. Okay. That they were graven with any iron pen. Graven? Graven with any iron pen and led in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day until the earth. 
And though after my skin worm destroys this body, yet in He just said what Paul said in Corinthians. Keep going. Yet in my flesh shall I see God, who I shall see for myself, and my eye shall behold, and not another, through my rind be consumed within me. But ye shall ye should say, Why persecute with me with him? Seeing the root of the matter in, is found in me. Okay. Now in the book of Job, his three friends are going to debate with him through a series of chapters. One person is going to sp speak, Job is going to answer him. Another one will speak, Job is going to answer him. All along, think about this. Job is laying there, or sitting there with boils all over his body from head to toe. He's going through intense pain and suffering. His friends, will you, what they think experience will cause you. My experience teaches me that the reason why you're suffering, you must have done something wrong. Another one will say, tradition teaches me that the reason why you're going through this is because you must have broke a custom. All along, they do not know that the Lord is the one that has allowed the devil to come and try to drag Job through the muck and mire. The devil wants to destroy, destroy you. God wants to build you up. Now, go to Job chapter 38. God is going to give Job a history lesson in science. Now, before we read that, Job lived in the time of the dinosaur because he's going to mention some animals that we don't know nothing about. The Leviathan. That's a dinosaur. I used to think that it was a rhinoceros, but really and truly it was a dinosaur. He read. Job 38, we're first. The one? Yeah. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? That's God speaking to Job. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Now see, Job had been questioning God. Why am I going through this? And we have to do the same thing. Verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said this far you may come, but no farther. And here you proud waves must stop. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take no hold of ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It takes on form like clay under a seal and stands out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld and the upraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in the search of the de or the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breath of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Now, notice him. This is God talking to Job. Job has said, if, I'm, if I can just get all this with God, I would ask him, why am I going through this? And this is what happens to us when we're going. God, where are you? Why am I going through this? We never say, well, Lord, what lesson are you trying to teach me? Hmm. Because after all, we always try to build up idle self. 
Job had said, well, I need to know why am I going through this? I thought I was living righteously. I thought I was living a clean life. I thought I was doing what you told me to do. He never knew, and God will never tell him, I put you up as a contestant in a battle that was between me and the devil. You are the contestant. Your mind is your battlefield. And so what you have to do is you have to be able to maintain your Christian relationship with Jesus Christ in the midst of pain, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of suffering, because the devil will always try to snatch that from you. Keep reading. Verse 19. Where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? That you may take it to its territory, that you may know the path to its home. Do you know it? Because you were born then or because the number of your days is great? Have you entered the treasury of snow or have you seen the treasure of hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? By what way is light diffused or the east wind scattered over the earth? Who has divided a channel for the overflowing water or a path for the thunderbolt to cause it to rain on a land where there is no one, mm -hmm. a wilderness in which there is no man, to satisfy the desolate waste and cause to spring forth the growth of tender grass? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the, comes the ice and the frost of heaven who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades, or loose the belt of Orion? Can Not you... right there. Now, next week I'm going to show you how we can put all those questions. Notice that it is God who's asking Job. Why do you think God asked Job those questions? To help him understand that he was nowhere near God. Job, you've maintained your integrity. You've maintained your faith in me. Keep it right there. Stay right there. Stick with me. Stick with me, Job. Because everything that I do has a purpose. Mm -hmm. You're wanting to ask me why, and I'm never going to tell you. Now, in the gospel, the disciples of Jesus saw a man that was blind, and they asked Jesus, who did sin, mm -hmm. this man or did his parents sin? What did Jesus say? To bring glory. It was to give glory to God. It happened because it was going to bring glory to God. I said this a week or so ago, that a lot of times we fail to realize that our pain and suffering is meant to expose the idle self in us. But in the same instance, God wants some glory out of that. This is why people have gotten up out of comas. This is why people have gotten sick when the doctor said you should have been dead. This is why people live on when the doctor said you only got 30 days to live. It was all to give because there's something more important than you living healthy and wealthy. That is the glory of God. Because if you're living healthy and wealthy, sooner or later you're going to want to snatch the glory that only belongs to God and, glory and have it for yourself. And you should never have it. All every child of God that will be in heaven, there's one thing everybody will have in common. And that is every one of them will have had a douse, a dose of pain and suffering. Every single one of them. Either through prosecution or persecution. Every single one of them. Jesus told his disciples, because they hated me, you know they're going to hate you. Because they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Because things are happening to you, you to me, you know they're going to do them to you. So we've got to understand that as a Christian follower, as a Christ follower, we're going to go through pain and suffering. We don't get to choose it. We don't get to say when. We don't get to say how long. We don't get to say what it is going to be. We don't get to do any of that. All of that is in the hands of the, what we need to do is to continue to ask the Lord to increase my faith, my mm -hmm. trust in you, no matter what I'm going through. It's hard, but yet at the same time, the Holy Spirit is right there to comfort us in the midst of our pain and our suffering. Job is laying there in the ash heap. He's going to say a lot of things. 
his friends are going to say even more. At the end of the story, it will be Job that will have to pray for his friends because the Lord got mad and angry with his friends and not so much with Job. Because at the end of the story, Job is going to say, I'm going to lay, I lay my hand on my mouth because I was speaking about things that were too great for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop right there and we will begin again next week because I'm going to pick it apart to let you see why God asked him no question. Because every question that God asked Job, Job didn't have an answer for none of them. Mm -mm. That was the show, Job, I am sovereign. I do what I please with whomever I please, however I please, and nobody can say, well, what are you doing? And I have to answer to him. God doesn't answer to anybody. If he does answer you, that's just his grace. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank and praise you. We thank and praise you for life. We thank and praise you for your love, and we thank and praise you for liberty. We thank and praise you, Lord God, for Christ. By his stripes, we are healed. We pray now, Lord God, that you would strengthen us and bless us as only you can. Be our strength. Never let us lose hope in thee. Increase our faith that we may see Christ in Christ alone. Destroy the idle self that is in all of us that we, O oh Lord God, may give your name to praise. Help us to deny ourselves that we may be strong disciples and bless your holy and righteous name. We do ask all these blessings in Christ Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.